That being said, uh, if you've got your Bible, go to Exodus chapter 20. We're gonna spend 10 weeks together in the 10 Commandments. And, uh, and since we're starting in the middle of a book, let me catch you up to speed. Exodus is actually part of something called the Pentateuch, which means book in five parts. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all written by Moses, uh, one book in five parts, and the Ten Commandments are right in the middle, tucked away there in Exodus chapter 20. And so really the story begins in Genesis after sin enters the world, God picks a person named Abraham to be saved and to be used by God to bring forth the nation of Israel and ultimately Jesus Christ. And he promises to bring a family and a blessing through Abraham and Sarah. Well, Abraham and Sarah have Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. This is working through the storyline of Genesis. And as we near the end of Genesis, we see that this man, Jacob, uh, he's got a family and he's got a lot of sons. And uh, one of these sons, the younger son named Joseph, well, he's sort of his dad's favorite. Bad things happen when dads play favorites. And uh, he's also a bit of an arrogant kid who likes to talk about himself and his brothers get a little sick of it. So they decide to get rid of him, to sell him into slavery and tell his dad, Jacob, that he's dead. So he is sold into slavery and off he goes to Egypt as a slave. Uh, though he is far away from God's people, uh, he is not far away from God because God draws near to him. And God comes and loves him and blesses him. And even though he is enslaved and at various points imprisoned, he is used by God to rise up as a very powerful, prominent, preeminent political leader. And he's working for the godless king of Egypt. It's the most powerful, influential nation in the history of the world to that time. Uh, it was Egypt in that day, in the days of the New Testament, it's the Roman Empire. Some would argue today it's the United States of America, but you're looking at this international powerhouse of a nation. What happens is that he has this opportunity um, to serve the Pharaoh and to serve the nation and God gives him great wisdom. Well, they're living in the midst of this season of plenty, multiple years of just record-breaking harvest, food for everybody, home prices are on the rise, no end in sight, everybody's investment portfolio is just coming up roses, and no one knows that there is a fiscal cliff in their immediate future. And so what happens is God reveals to Joseph that lean years of famine are coming, so store up in the years of plenty in preparation for the years of, of lack and want and need. Uh, this happens, and as a result, while other nations are starving, the nation of Egypt is flourishing because of the wise presence of a great leader and manager named Joseph. Back to his family and his father who thinks he's dead. Uh, his brothers come to Egypt seeking really survival. Uh, their land is in famine and they are starving to death. There's this amazing reunion between Joseph and his brothers and he forgives them. And it's a picture of Jesus who though we've sinned against him and threw him down in a pit, he came out to forgive and embrace and love and reconcile with us. And then Jacob reconciles with his son, finds out he's alive. It's this amazing reconciliation story. And Joseph invites his father and his brothers to move to Egypt so that they can live under his blessing and provision. 440 years pass between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus. And yes, I think you should read it. And what happens there is it's a new Pharaoh. And this family of Jacob's that entered into Egypt as a family of about 70 people, 440 years later, because their kids who had kids who had kids who had kids, they're a nation of a few million people, the great nation of Israel. And the Pharaoh is a different leader who now hates, despises, enslaves, and abuses God's people. They are in misery. If you can think of it, your children, your children's children, will all be slaves for hundreds of years, nothing but slaves, no hope, no prosperity, no future, no love, no grace, no betterment. God's people reach a point where they cry out to him begging for deliverance. 
And God hears and answers prayer. We need to know that, particularly when we're suffering and in need. And that God determines that he will set his people free. And he will do so through a mediator, a man named Moses, who's a prophet. And he is representing and foreshadowing the coming of Jesus who will stand between us and God and speak God's truth to us. Moses is a man who lost his temper and murdered somebody. Moses is a man who has a speech impediment. Moses is a man who is a bit of a coward. And God chooses him because God can do extraordinary things through ordinary people. And because it's for his glory, when he uses someone like Moses or me or you, everyone knows that it was the grace of God, not the gifts of the servant. Moses is then told, go to the Pharaoh and tell him what to do. Of course, I'm paraphrasing, but no one tells the Pharaoh what to do because he thinks he's God. No one comes into his presence and says, I demand this. But God commands Moses as his messenger to do precisely that. Go tell the Pharaoh that he's not God, that there's a real God. The real God's not happy with the way he's treating his children. Go tell the false God that the real God says, let my people go, that they might be free to worship me. And that's freedom. Freedom is not the ability to do what you want. Freedom is the ability to do what you were made for by God. I want them free to worship me. And if he will not let them go, then I will bring punishment and plagues upon him. And I want you to see that God is very loving, very compassionate, very patient, very kind with the Pharaoh because he keeps sending Moses and Moses keeps inviting him to submit to the real God and to walk away from his own sin. Yet what the Bible says is that Pharaoh continually hardened his heart. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a hard heart? Some of us stand back in judgment of Pharaoh, but we overlook the fact that we're much like him. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. And he didn't want the real God telling him what to do. That's a hard heart. You and I, if we're honest, we at least have seasons of hardness of heart where God says no and we say yes, where we disagree with God, where we defy God, where we disobey God. That's what Pharaoh did. The Bible says, in addition to Pharaoh hardening his heart, that God hardened his heart. This is the first 19 chapters of Exodus. You could read it for yourself. And the way that God hardened his heart is through love and grace and patience and kindness. The Puritans were fond of saying that the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. Some of us, when we hear from God, we melt. Oh, you're right, I'm wrong, I need to change. Thank you for telling me the truth. Others of us, we harden. No, I will not change. I will not agree. I will not relent. I will not repent. I will edit God's word. I will ignore God's word. I will find another God. I will be my own God, but I will not submit to that God. That's hardness of heart. So we say, I don't have a hard heart. Every time we sin, it's ultimately the result of hardness of heart. And so the plagues, they become increasingly more costly. All of a sudden, it's ruining their environmental well-being. It's harming their economy. It's destroying their spirituality. The nation is really suffering. And it culminates with the killing of the firstborn. The firstborn son, particularly in that culture, that was the hope of the family. That's the legacy of the family. That's the future of the family. That's the one who will take care of you in your old age and make sure that your name goes into the future. God says, if you will not let my people go, I will take some of your people. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And the Bible says, in a night, death came and the firstborn male child, the son in every household, died. Okay? How many of you are firstborn sons? How many firstborn sons? Okay. okay, look around the room. All dead. Okay, how many of you have a firstborn son? My son's firstborn son's name is Zach. Dead. 
in a night. See, the wage for sin is what? Death. And see, death comes one at a time, so we don't pay a lot of attention. When death comes all at once, we're overwhelmed by the fact that sin leads to death. And in Egypt, sin led to death, and death came at once for all. The Bible says that there was weeping in Egypt. I mean, just think of an entire nation where all the firstborn sons are dead and all the mothers are weeping. Some lost a son, some also lost a husband. You men who raised your hand, dead. All your firstborn sons, dead. We'd have a massive funeral. I couldn't preach it because I'd be dead too. There was only one exception and that was those who in faith participated in something called the Passover. God pours out his wrath and he provides provision for his wrath to pass over us. And that was that God's people would gather as a family, that they would take a lamb without spot or blemish, symbolizing sinlessness and perfection, that they would acknowledge their sins before God and those sins would be imputed to the lamb, that the lamb would be the substitute, that the lamb would then be slaughtered because the wage for sin is death. And then to show publicly that they belong to the Lord, they would take the blood of the lamb and they would paint the exterior doorposts of their home so that when death came to every home, it would literally pass over those homes who had their repentance of sin demonstrated in the shed blood of the lamb. This is all pointing to Jesus. Tell your Jewish friends, it's all pointing to Jesus. There is no Passover without Jesus. He is the one who is alone, the sacrifice for our sins, the substitute, the lamb who was slain, and the one alone who alleviates the wrath of God from coming upon us. God then delivers his people. God liberates his people. He sets them free. He parts the Red Sea, and now a nation of a few million former slaves are set free. But they're not living free. They're committing adultery. They're stealing from one another. They're coveting. They're lying. They're not raising their children in the Lord. They're worshiping false gods in addition to the real God. Though they are set free, they have chosen to not live free. So God's gonna speak to them. God's gonna be loving and gracious and patient and merciful, just as he was with the Pharaoh, as he was with them, as he is with us. And that brings us to the 10 commandments. And I tell you all of this because if we only start in chapter 20, we read the Bible like those who are Jewish or Muslim or moralistic or political or Jehovah's Witness or Mormon, do this, don't do that. If you do this, God will punish you. If you don't do that, God will bless you. That's not it. It's in the context of God has already loved. God has already served. God has already set free. God has already adopted these kids into his family. This is not about obeying him so that he will love you. It's about him loving you and helping you to obey. The context is very important. We can't ignore the first 19 chapters and launch into morality in the 20th chapter. And so then God speaks to his people and here's what he has to say. Uh, first, he tells them that he is the God who loves to set free. Exodus 20, verses one and two. And God spoke all these words saying, okay, first thing, who speaks? God. This is what God says. This is what we believe. That what God says, the Bible says. What the Bible says, God says. Somebody come to the Ten Commandments and say, I disagree. Then you disagree with God. You say, well, that's his opinion. And I would say, so go with it. <laughs> See, here the Pentateuch is written by Moses. It says it in the first five books. It says it in Paul's letters. It says it in the teachings of Jesus, it's college time, you're back to school, a lot of you are gonna take some Bible class at some loony college, 
The first thing I'm gonna tell you is Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. Yes, he did. He says he does. Paul says he does. Jesus says he does. It doesn't matter what the guy at community college says. Moses wrote the first five books. And though Moses here is writing, it's ultimately God who is speaking. It's God who's speaking. Marcel, I need you to know this. When we open the Bible, God is speaking to you. You're hearing from him, okay? So we don't believe that this is alongside of philosophy or religion or spirituality or ideology. We don't believe that this is speculation about God. We believe this is revelation from God. At Mars Hill Church, that is bedrock for us. That is bedrock for us. So God's gonna say something. Anybody wanna hear from God? God's gonna say something. I am the Lord your God. I'm Yahweh. It's me. It's me. This is, a, this is a God who's speaking to everybody at once. Some would say this is the only time in the Bible that God assembled all of his people to speak directly to him. This is unprecedented. This is very important. This is historically in a category unto itself. He's gonna start by telling us who he is. Here's the truth. Apart from revelation, we would not know who God is. If God didn't tell us who he is, we would not know who he is. And here's the good news, our God tells us who he is. He says, I'm the Lord your God. It's very personal. I'm Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of what? Slavery. The problem is slavery. The solution is God. The problem is always slavery. And the solution is always God. This is not just a story about what happened, but about what always happens. This is not an old book. It's a timeless book, so it's always timely. And what God is doing here, he is giving us laws. We're gonna jump in a moment into the 10 commandments, but the Bible gives us laws. Those first five books of the Old Testament called the books of the law. Not surprising, they're filled with law. Some would say 68.5% of the first five books of the Old Testament have laws. They counted them, there's 613 laws. The 10 commandments are the summary and center of the law. God's gonna give us laws. How many of you are not particularly excited about law? Okay, law. How many of you are like, I don't like law. How many of you, right now if I said, hey, the IRS came out with new tax code, Every Sunday for 10 weeks, we're gonna go through the fine print. We're gonna look at all the details. How many of you would not be here? Okay, I wouldn't be here either. You know, how many of you, if your boss says, hey, come on into the break room, you know, corporate just sent out a whole bunch more policies and we're gonna go over them. How many of you don't run into the break room? Quoting the Psalms in your heart. I delight in the law in my innermost being. Give me more rules about the coffee machine, right? Yeah, it's just... When we think of law, we tend to think of law that is unhelpful. Is God's law like that? Many people think it is. The two most influential people in my estimation outside of the Bible for our understanding of the law are two guys named John Calvin and Martin Luther. I like them. I have a son named Calvin Martin, so I get a pass. I like them both, okay? But... They were both trained as attorneys. Great Bible teachers, amazing. And I love what they have to say about law and gospel and super insightful. But in reading the Bible as an attorney, you could miss something that I think is very important for you. Commandments or laws or rules are different when they come from a father most assuredly different than when they come from a dictator. Pharaoh had laws, but they were not loving life-giving laws for the children of God. Um, How many of you have rebellious kids? Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you have kids? Okay, you have rebellious kids too. Okay. Uh, (laughs) How many babysat kids? That's why you don't have any kids, okay? Um, I love my kids. You love your kids. We love our kids. True or false, 
Kids sometimes rebel and do foolish things. They do. And so what a good father should do is call what we title a family meeting. Okay? You always know that something's gone wrong when dad says, family meeting, everybody on the couch. It's like, oh, somebody did something. And we're gonna talk about this, right? And some of you have those family meetings. You're like, okay, sweetheart, you need to find clothes and uh, wear them to elementary school. And you need to, son, stop smoking and finish third grade. Like we're, we got <laughs> some things to work on here at the family meeting, right? When God gathers his children at the base of Mount Sinai and comes down to talk to them and give them his laws, it is not him saying, do these things and I will adopt you. It's him saying, I've adopted you and I need you to do these things because I love you and they're good for you and they're good for others. And part of the struggle with law is this. If law is disconnected from lawgiver, we could misunderstand the heart of the law. This is why the Pharisees many years later, they love the law, but not the Lord. Because for them, they focused on the law more than the lawgiver. The Hebrew word here for law is Torah. We're in the Old Testament. It's originally written in Hebrew. We have a hard time translating that word into the English language, so we use the word law. It's not necessarily a bad word, but it can cause some problems because we think IRS tax code, speed limits, you know, cumbersome governmental bureaucracy and middle management at our company. It's also a word that's used in Proverbs. When the father who loves his kids is teaching them how to live wisely so that they might flourish and have life. And the father says it this way, my son, open your ear and listen to my Torah. Okay. That's different, right? It's different. So for parents in general, but fathers in particular, we don't just drop law on our kids. Sit down with them, look them in the eye, kiss them on the forehead, tell them we love them, pray over them. Tell them that we can't love them any less or more because we're wholeheartedly devoted to them no matter what. And then tell them that we want their life to flourish and we want them to be blessed. And so we're gonna talk about some things and lay down some rules because we want them to not suffer and we want others not to suffer. That's the father heart of God. And if you separate the law from the father heart of the lawgiver, you end up questioning, is God good? Does God love me? Does God care? Is God interested? Or, or is God just you know, a faraway dictator who sends laws and if I obey them, I get to be a citizen and if I disobey them, I get to burn forever? I'll give you an example, an illustration that perhaps will help. So I've got five kids. I love them with all my heart. We moved into a house some years ago and I'm in the house studying. I got the window cracked for fresh air and I hear the, the weirdest sound. It was like this clunk, 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 clunk. I'm like, what, what? I go outside and, uh, and I hear the noise up the street. Now, one of my sons, he had one of those little Jeeps, one of those plug-in, power them up kid Jeeps with a hard... Um, tires on it, and he's far away from our house, leaving, okay? Uh, and the clunk, clunk, clunk is him driving on the gravel. And he's about four. So um, I run after him, stand for, oh, hey buddy, where are you going? He's like, I'm going to get donuts. Okay? <laughs> I said, hey, hey buddy, you can't go get donuts. He's like, I'll be back later. <laughs> now in his mind, this is great freedom. Finally, a vehicle. <laughs> but that much freedom will lead to his suffering. I mean, he was literally ready to merge onto a street that has like a 40 mile an hour speed limit. As his father, I realized that freedom will harm him. So it wasn't very long thereafter, and what do you think I built? A fence, okay? Now, it, it, you know, if my kid had went to college and, you know, 
studied Kant. He could have stood in the yard, looked at the fence and look at this oppression that limits my freedom of choice and my ability to express myself. Look at the limitations that my unkind father has burdened me with. And as a father, I would say, actually, this is an act of love. If you hop the fence, you're gonna get hurt. If you wander off property, you're gonna get hurt. I want you to enjoy the whole yard, but don't leave your father's household because it will be to your ruin. We don't know this because we're rebels. We don't remember this because we are fatherless. We didn't have a dad or we didn't have a dad like God. And when God gives us laws, if we don't see him as a father kissing us on the forehead, sitting with us on the couch, telling us how much he loves us and telling us that every law is a board in the fence to preserve our life so that we can run freely without being harmed, then we will altogether reject a loving father who wants life for his kids. Every one of God's laws is just a plank in the fence. And when you see it, remember that your father loves you. And freedom is not freedom to jump the fence, but freedom to play in the yard, amen?